the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and um, let's look at something that was very, very, very popular and famous um, for us as a church and for Christians in general. These are the last words recorded by, by Matthew in his gospel, and um, I'm sure they're going to be a blessing, a very big blessing to us today. I want to give credit to uh, Dr. Carson um, O'Donnell, who wrote a commentary on Matthew, and Chad Bird, who had a, an article that he contributed um, on a subject that I'll end with today as well. I would like to preach this sermon or share this sermon with you in tribute of a person named Trevor Ayers. He is my dad. And uh, he's a pastor, he's a missionary, he's a church planter, and he's the one who continues to teach me what it means to go. The Great Commission is what this passage is all about. Verses 16 through to verse 20. And let me make this statement that has been made before by others. I'll share it with you. The Great Commission is known by Christians, but generally misunderstood by the church. It was not misunderstood, however, by one man. His name was William Carey. I share that name with you so maybe you could read a little bit about him. It's been said that he was the greatest missionary since the time of the apostles. He was born in 1761. He left England in 1793 the age of 32, so keep that timeline in your mind. He went to serve in India, and he would never return. He died on the field, that's a term that missiologists call the place where you go to serve the Lord. He died on the field in 1834 after 41 years of service there. He died among the people that he'd been called to give his life for. So my question of his, you know, his testimony, his story, is what kept him in India? What made the difference? Why did he go? And the answer, I believe, is the Great Commission, recorded here in these verses. The Great Commission requires of us four responses, or it will fail as we fail. So let's listen to these four responses. You can take them down and ponder them maybe this afternoon and going on to the future now as we plan to a new year of ministry and mission in our church. Here's number one. The first response is seeking, verses 16 and 17. Take a look at your Bible and let me read those verses for you. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him but some doubted, some doubted. Notice the geography moving from the city to the area of Galilee. So we're going to a more remote area. There would have been associated with this move, a movement out of comfort to what we say out of our comfort zone, to a place would be much more difficult to minister. Galilee, also known for its inhabitants being predominantly Gentile. I think it's important to remember in terms of the place that Jesus asked them to go. Look, there's lots of other reasons. I'm tempted to share them with you, but I don't have time this morning. Uh, maybe I'll just like, give you a little tip. You may want to compare the Sermon on the Mount with this Mount meeting as well. The first words of Jesus in his ministry with the last words of Jesus in his ministry. Very interesting comparison there. Eleven disciples travel, not twelve so be encouraged by the fact that this is not a perfect group. Things are not ideal. You know the story, right? You know what happened. And so now they meet as 11, not perfect, but yet are called by God to be used for his mission. And the went is an important word to think about. They went to Galilee, they went to the mountain, and they went and worshiped. And I am just blessed by the way the Bible's laid out that way. As directed, they were obedient. It was not easy, out of their comfort zone, Galilee. They went to the mountain. The Bible's full of examples of people that climb mountains to meet with God. And I think this is no different. I think it's just to get close to God, maybe. 
That's how I remember it anyway. You climb a mountain, you get closer to God, and it seems that there's many occasions where men and women would climb mountains to be close to God. That's the point that's been made here. And then they went and they worshipped. They went and they worshipped. They met with the risen, triumphant Lord, and parts, elements, aspects of their worship were that they surrendered to Him everything that they had, and that they came in submission to Him of themselves to God. And I think we must keep those two things in mind, submission and surrender, as we worship as well. But the Bible says that some doubted. I read that verse and I thought, sure, that's quite interesting. I looked at the original and found out that it could be translated hesitated, which kind of gives me a little nuance on how to understand what's being said here. I mean, you want to worship the Lord wholeheartedly, but then you've just been, this, this huge impression has been made in your mind of the cross and all the torture of Jesus and the burial and the three days and the fact that he was definitely dead. Am I confused? Have I got the story right? You can understand what's going on in the hearts of these that are trying to commit their lives fully to the Lord. There was some hesitation, and with us it's gonna be the same as well. We don't have the Lord in the flesh to communicate with, and so there are gonna be times in our worship as well where there's hindrance by a hesitation, a doubt, that creeps in, and even in those times, I wanna be faithful to say to you, go to the mountain and worship your Lord. Go. When you don't know what God is doing, worship. When you are hurting or angry or broken or crushed, worship. When you're discouraged or depressed or experiencing despair even, worship your Lord. When you are hopeless or fearful or facing death's door, even in those times, climb a mountain and worship your Lord. There's so much content to fuel your worship. Years and years of knowing Him and years and years of, of learning about Him and trusting Him. Years and years of faithfulness. Worship, church. Surrender yourself to Him. Excuse me, submit yourself to Him and surrender all you have to him as you come to worship him. This is the seeking which the Great Commission requires. If you really read those verses I read just a moment ago very carefully, you'll see this to be the theme of seeking the Lord. Obedience out of your comfort zone, climbing near to God, and worshiping, submission and surrender of all that we are and have. Amen? Seeking. Number two. Listening, verse 18. Take a look in your Bible there, verse 18. Jesus has something to say. And Jesus came and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And these apostles, disciples, were those that listened very carefully to what he had to say. So let me explain it. The authority that's being spoken about here is the right to use power. We do not face a lost world, church, listen, listen. We don't face a lost world in our own authority. We face a lost world in His authority. His authority to do anything, anywhere, anytime, anyhow. Over you and over me, His authority reigns. In the present, in the future, all authority belongs to our God, amen? Over all our possessions, God has authority. He has all authority over our lives, our families, our possessions, our home, our business, our wealth. All authority means that God can take what He likes, He can do what He wishes, and He can change whom He wants. Without any obligation, without any permission from anyone, without any explanation either, His ways are not our ways. Amen? That's what it means to have all authority. And the Great Commission requires that Christ's disciples seek Him in worship, that was the first point, and His disciples come under His authority. They fall in line. They say, yes, sir, yes, Lord, you are the master and I am the servant. And we do this by listening to Him. There's more coming but we do it firstly by listening to him. So you got this clear so far? 
There's a seeking that is required by the Great Commission. There is a listening that is required by the Great Commission. There is thirdly now, a obeying, an obeying that is required by the Great Commission. Verse 19, let's have a look. Verse 19, I'll read it for you. This is probably the climatic verse of this whole text of Scripture. No doubt climatic in terms of what Matthew has to say. This is the last thing that's recorded by the gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So listen carefully and look at these words and phrases very, very carefully. Go therefore, talking about the authority, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So I'm noticing this little word all, side note, ring them all. All authority, for example. Then there's all nations. I see all that I have commanded you. And there's one other one. Go ahead and hunt that down. Wow, what a text. Notice a few things. Just journey with me through this verse. Notice the go firstly. In the original, this is very special tensing. And if you have been a Christian for any length of time, I'm sure you've heard this explained. What is being said by this particular word in the original language, which incorporates tense and mood and other things, is this, having traveled. I, I would go so far as to write that in my margin of my Bible, so that you know. It's not just the head out there, pack your bags and go. It's having traveled, or while you are going, I like that translation the best, or as you go, is the sentiment of what has been described here or said here by, by the Lord. Go, therefore. Go, therefore. In your sphere of influence, Jesus is saying, make disciples. Make disciples. We'll talk about that later. This going here is not a command. It's not. The main idea of command is coming in the verse. The main command being to make disciples. But what is being said here is this idea of as you go, be on mission for God. So I've got a question for you. Do you view your going as mission for the Lord? And I mean, there's so many examples I can give here. You're going to the grocery store. You're going to school, watching sport at school. You're going to work. You're going to play on the sport field. I mean, let your mind wonder to how you travel. You go near, you go far. Some of you go very far around the world sometimes. Whatever it is that is your while going, your as your go is what is being spoken about here. So the question is, if the mission is just your mission, and I just run in the Kloof village, so I run to the grocery store 2Ks that way, I run to the gym 2Ks this way, I run to the school 2Ks that way, that's my 2K radius. Why is there such a big deal made in our church about going far? like going on mission to the ends of the earth. The simple answer, people on the other side of the world haven't heard either. So you've got a person working at the till who hasn't heard, or at the petrol pump that hasn't heard, somebody in your classroom that hasn't heard the good news about Jesus. There are people just like this all over the world that still need to hear about the Lord and what he has done, who he is and what he has done. And I just wanna encourage you that our church is involved in a much bigger radius than 2Ks. As we plan for the new year, we are planning to take our church family to our Jerusalem, which is no locally, but to our Judea and Samaria as well. And that geographical boundary will be slightly further away, cross cultural and language barriers. And so sign up for these things. Grow in your experience, starting familiar and then moving to something more out of your comfort zone. And as you do that, you will see the need and the reason why we go far. Such need in Africa at the moment. It's burning need for the gospel of Jesus, burning need for baptism, burning need for teaching from Jesus. All that I have commanded, that's why we go far. And I pray we will go further and further to fulfill this commission. Notice something else, the therefore in the text, therefore. It's quite simple, I pointed out in the reading, it's because of the authority that's given. And this is such an encouragement to me because we are covered by this authority before, because we are empowered 
by this grand authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and do this making of disciples through baptism and do this making of disciples through the teaching of all that I have commanded you is how that verse works. Draw a diagram in your Bible to understand it. The main idea is the making disciples. The main idea, let's look at it. We have noticed so far in the verse, the go, we've noticed the therefore. Now thirdly, let's notice the making of disciples. The dominant imperative, if you want to be a language person. The dominant imperative, making disciples. The command in the text is to make disciples. This is, church, what we must do, according to the words of Jesus. Under God, this is central to the Great Commission, the making of disciples. Notice that it's not making of church members. We introduced somebody into membership this morning, and of course, in the process of making disciples, this is a very biblical end and result of making of disciples. But it's not the end in itself. The end in itself is to make disciples, to make followers of Jesus, genuine followers. I can put another word there, apprentices of Jesus, if you like that word. I do. To make disciples is our call. The commission is for us to make disciples, to learn by listening and by doing. So let me make a statement right now, a conclusive statement. All believers are called to make disciples. Every single one that claims to be a child of God, that claims to be a believer, that claims to be a follower, that claims to be a missionary of the Lord is called by God to make disciples. That's you and me. If you know the Lord, that's you and me. So notice the model. There's a model in the text given. Jesus just doesn't end there and say, well, you know, I'm gonna tell you that you must go do this in these red letters, but I'm not going to tell you how. No, no, no. He gives us a model. Take a look at it in your Bible. There is a sharing of the gospel, and I just found another definition of the gospel this week that I wanna share with you. The life, sharing, sharing, communicating with your mouth, the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and the benefits of these, life, death, burial, and resurrection, the benefit of these for sinners. I like that definition, do you? It's simple. It's simple, that's exactly what we are called to do, to share the gospel, to bring people to Jesus, and then there are two very distinct stepping stones in this process given by Jesus. To baptize and to teach. Ring them in your Bible so you have them. Baptize being to give someone a badge of discipleship, somebody said. And I like things that are simple. How about you? I like things to be made simple. And I, I just like that picture. Here's our baptistry on my right-hand side. It's a font. It's a, it's a pool, basically. We fill it with water. And we baptize people. We, we, we dunk them under water regularly. And what we are doing on that occasion is giving people that by profession have claimed to be followers of Jesus. And for as much as we can know on this earth, we are convinced that they are following the Lord faithfully at that point by their testimony and their actions and other things. We are giving badges of discipleship publicly. And so Carson would go on to say that there's a little element that needs to be included here of community, which I like, and that is Baptism becoming symbolic of a total commitment to a brand new community. So why do we do it publicly? That's why. So that the community can witness a total commitment to a new community being made, a badge being given of baptism. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Who wants to stand in front of a whole group of people like you lot and get wet publicly. Not easy. Is following Jesus easy? No. This is the first step of thousands, millions of steps that an individual will take in terms of their following of the Lord, none of which will be easy. No, no, no. Not if you're gonna be committed to professing, to proclaiming the truth that I just shared of the gospel 
in your sphere of influence. It all ties together. By the way, today we're having a meeting after church. We've publicized this to various people we know are interested. There's a large group, actually, that are interested in baptism, that are exploring, that are considering God's call on their life to be obedient in baptism. And so happening right after the service upstairs, there's a meeting happening. It's informal, and you are welcome. I'm inviting you now. Come along and hear what God's Word's got to say. Ask your questions. Some of them are going to be practical. Some of them are going to be theological. Bring them. And let's address those things today together. And may God lead you to this place of receiving a badge of discipleship symbolic of a total commitment to a brand new community, baptism. But there's another little additional emphasis in the text here in terms of this making of disciples, and that is the teaching. These two things, baptism and teaching, are they're kind of riding on the shirt tails of the making of disciples. That's the main idea. So I think we've got it by now. I've said it three times this morning. So let's look at the second, teaching. To observe all that I have commanded, Jesus said. That is a lot of information. And John said, I think it was the last message that I preached in the Gospels, John said, if there was all that in the world to keep them. So much had been shared with these close followers of the Lord to impart to others. This is no small thing. No, it's not. I just want to say, I'm just very proud to be part of a church right now that is committed to baptism and that is committed to teaching. I am just very proud to be a part of this church. And we make this a focus because it was the focus of the Lord, the emphasis of his parting shot here to the church. Teaching is therefore, listen to this, a means, the means of somebody living completely governed by all that I have commanded you. Got it? So you got this initial badge of baptism, badge of baptism and discipleship. Hey, church family, I just want you to know, that's what's happening in this water, I just want you to know that I am a follower of Jesus and I have committed my life to follow him. I want you to know that. And I'm gonna show you right now by associating with Christ in a death and burial and a resurrection to a new life in Christ. Does that make sense? It's very dramatic, super dramatic. And it's gonna be all this wet washing kind of thing going on to show you that I've been forgiven of my sin and washed clean by the work of Christ on the cross. That's what's going on in summary. Now the teaching now, the teaching now is more added to it. It is somebody now living completely governed by all that has been commanded by Christ, taking his word and living by it. It's not enough just to be dunked in water and to make a profession, but there's more, there's the teaching. It's taking the word of Christ, the command of Christ and saying, I wanna be governed by this. Ongoing now, till my dying day, I wanna be governed by this. I am submitting, do you see how this is tying together? I'm surrendering, I'm submitting, I'm worshiping. This is where I find myself, under the command of the Lord. Yes, Lord. A life now governed by a new boss, a new Lord, a new master, a life of obedience is what the commission is all about. So you may ask me, well, how can they be obedient if they know not what to obey, and the answer is they can't. That's why we are committed to the teaching, to the ongoing teaching in terms of disciple making. Are you with me so far? Normally I have three points. Bonus point number four, <laughs> trusting. Verse 20, trusting. Four responses to the Great Commission, and these things I'm praying the Holy Spirit will lay on your heart. Climb the mountain, seek the Lord. Listen, listen carefully, obey, now number four, trust. Trust the one who does not and cannot fail. And behold, this is what Jesus said, I am with you always. Fact, by the way. You know that Jesus is om, 
knee present. Of course, there's nuance here to the Holy Spirit, but you know that God is omnipresent? So I believe. You're going to see all sorts of Trinity language come out of the Scriptures here. Not the word Trinity, but the idea, the truth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's all here. Fact. I am with you always. To the end of the age, Jesus said. And I tell you, it's like a, a wave of relief covers my soul when I read this. Because I don't know about you, I'm quite challenged by the Great Commission. I'm quite exercised by what Jesus had to call me to. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptize, teach them all that I've commanded. Good night, Lord, I'm overwhelmed until these words rock up. And all of a sudden, there's this peace that fills my soul. Behold, I'm going to be with you always. To the end of the age, I'm going to be with you. God has a plan, church. He knows the plan to the end. He's the Lord of history, and the climax is the end. I don't know if you're aware of this. The climax is the end. Jesus' return. When all the nations have heard, and there are disciples from every ethno-linguistic people group on the earth. Can you imagine? Oh, please do imagine this. Every ethno-linguistic little people group. We're not talking about national boundaries here. When we talk about nations, we're talking about ethno-linguistic people groups of the world. Wow. They're going to be gathered together on the earth. Until then, Jesus is saying, if I could summarize everything, make disciples. Make disciples. Make disciples. It must be on the top of your to-do list, the top of your priority list, the top of your agenda, to make disciples until the end. J.C. Ryle said it so eloquently. I wrote it in my notes here. He, being Jesus, is with us daily to pardon and forgive. With us daily to sanctify and strengthen. With us daily to defend and keep. With us daily to lead and to guide. With us in sorrow and with us in joy. With us in sickness and with us in health. With us in life and with us in death with us in time, and with us in eternity. Amen? Don't be discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed. He's with you. He's with you. These are four responses to the Great Commission, I believe, that we can hear and implement this morning. Seeking, the listening, the obeying, and the trusting. William Carey he grew up in poverty and a lack of formal education. But man, he, he was educated by God's word and he was educated by the school of hard knocks. You know it? And when he reached the mission field, he faced one hardship after another. Read his biography or material from biographies about him. In terms of his ministry, he went to India and there was no Indian convert no one to sign up to follow Jesus or to be baptized in seven years. I mean, I, I just imagine how that goes. You know, you committed your whole life to this project and year passes after year after year and there's just no fruit to what you're doing. Man, disease was rampant and his, what the story goes, his, his wife suffered from deterioration of her mind. Eventually, the, the end of the, of the catalog of hardship is there and you read of him being present at the burial of two of his wives, three of his children, among other many, many disappointments. 41 years in India without a furlough. That's why he's famous. Of course he's famous because of the fruit of his ministry and the legacy that he left long term. But 41 years without a furlough. You know what a furlough is? 
a furlough is when a missionary comes back to their home country for a bit of a rest, take a break. Not for William Carey. 41 years straight, eventually dying on the field, never returning home. I have to ask myself the question, how, how, how do I become a missionary like that? Answer, in this text, seeking, listening, obeying, and trusting. That's how he did it. I was going to say, amen, let's pray. But something came to mind of a bigger picture that I want to share with you as we close today. There is something familiar about the Great Commission. Just reading it, there's something familiar. The last words, look, look, we, we're done. Matthew's done. The last words of Matthew's gospel, and I believe it goes right the way back to the first chapter of the Bible. You want to turn there, you're welcome to go there. Something familiar, in Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You hear the familiarity? Fill the earth. Think about it. Think about it deeply. Are you with me, church? Church family, are you, are you here? Everybody born in Genesis 1 prior to sin, got the picture, would be born a worshiper. Think about it. Automatically. Born Outside of sin, born a worshiper. But then sin came, Genesis chapter three. Sadly, we read of Adam falling. He's our representative, so don't pick on him because if you were there, you would have done exactly the same thing. Such is the nature of our heart. He falls, humanity from that point would be born in sin. So you got the spectrum. Born a worshiper in the beginning, sin now we are born sinners. I'm going to say it again. Born a worshiper, but now born sinners. This is our big plot. This is our big need. This is our big concern, our big worry, our big problem. These are, li- these are words that are too light to describe our condition before a holy God. We are born sinners. The ramifications of that are that we are separated from him We are in in our guilt, standing in front of the court of the judge of the universe. We are guilty. We are under the wrath and fury of God, which burns toward us as sinners. He's not just a lovey, cuddly God that will just forgive. He burns in anger towards sinners. In our rebellion, and our disbelief, man, Adam's just our representative. It's bad news. Bad news. But praise God, when you read the scriptures, there's more after Genesis 3. Have you noticed? There's a whole lot more. And the Bible describes good news from that point onward. From that point, Genesis 3, good news starts to seep into the pages of your Bible. As sacrifices are made and things like that, which point our attention to a second Adam. His name is Jesus. God sent him. He paid the penalty of our rebellion toward God and he obeyed where Adam rebelled or where you rebelled. Insert your own name. And he offers his perfect record to people who put their faith in him for free. Good news. Now, after his, and when I say now, I'm looking at like the last page of my, of my Matthew. Now, after the death and resurrection of Jesus has been accomplished, and the work of Jesus done, we sang about it in our worship earlier this morning. It is finished. It is done. After that, he is able now to commission us back to God's original plan, Genesis 1, in the beginning of your Bible. Go fill the earth with worshipers. Do you guys get it? It's incredible. Not by procreation and being born automatically a worshiper, but by proclamation and being born again. Praise God. 
The end picture is being redeemed, and worshipers all over the earth are on the increase right now as we remain faithful to this commission, empowered by all authority in heaven and earth. That's why Revelation, the end, oh man, it's got a point there because we're doing this show and tell here. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 12. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We know all about Him. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might, worship, be to our God forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pray with me. Father, today we see the, the Bible pull so tightly together again. In the sermon series, we've seen it countless times. Lord, how we are reminded to the original ideas of commission in Genesis. And now a repeat of this wording. What a privilege is ours to be part of the mission of God. To be part of this grand redemption of humanity from sin. Oh Lord, I pray that you would call men and women, boys and girls this morning to take the good news of Jesus to the world. As we go, we set foot out of this room this morning. We are going to bump into people that do not know you as their personal savior, are not forgiven and therefore do not have eternal life or any other benefit that is part of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you would lay on our heart through your spirit such conviction to be proclaimers of this good news. The result being that many would come to faith. Yeah, many would come to faith. They'd trust you for the first time, and depend on you for salvation. To look to your sacrifice and, and learn that it is enough to cover their sin, their iniquity, their shortcoming. Oh God, use us in this regard and may the fruit be much. People from every nation, tribe, tongue, language being gathered before the throne of God to sing the praises that you deserve Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to God forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. This is our prayer. Use us. Amen.